geeks and geekettes, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, gats and kittens, comic book fans the world over. Welcome once again to Ask Chuck Dixon, where you get to ask me a world-renowned, world-famous, world-celebrated, stopped on the street and asked a million questions. Well, you get to ask me the questions today. And what are the questions about? They are about what I do for a living. And what I do for a living, you know it. I write comic books. It's a silly job. <laughs> I'm so glad I have it. Oh, man. Here we go. Philip Russert reached out on Facebook. And he said, how did you get the knowledge of how Americans spoke back then? Hunter Ninja Bear. That's what always impresses me with you. I know you're a history buff, but how does one, uh, whatever. How does one, well, I don't know what you're trying to say here, but I think, how, how do I capture the dialect of different time periods? Boy, if you could only edit private messages, huh? Uh, <laughs> yeah, Hunter Ninja Bear, um, in, in, Hunter Ninja Bear in particular, had to capture the patois, the common speaking language of people in the early 1800s. And um, how do you do that? Well, as I, as I mentioned in videos before, um, people lived regionally. You know, they lived in their county, their town, their valley, their village. And most people didn't travel very far from where they were born. And they talked to people who were just from their region. It's how we get regional accents, how we get regional dialects. But more than that, there was no shared language, really. Uh, you could read English in books, obviously. Um, but people don't talk like in books. You know, you read books, but you don't absorb that language and then talk that way. It's not the way our brains work. We use an entirely different part of our brain when we read than when we speak or that when we write. So anyway, so you're living in some little, you know, podunk village in, you know, or town in western Pennsylvania or Wyoming or, you know, wherever. Uh, you might even be an immigrant, recent immigrant to the United States. I'm talking early 1800s. Um, and you're going to have still have the influences of your native land, be it you know French, German, Dutch, whatever. And you add to that the isolation of these various communities. Most people were agrarian. Most people, 75% of the population in the United States at that time, lived rural. They did not live in the cities. And once again, there was no shared language beyond books. There was no radio. There was no television. Our, our language as radio became more popular and film and television, our, our, our language, the English language, you know, in, in America, homogenized. So we all roughly speak the same way. We use the same phraseology. We use the same lexicon and vocabulary. Well, early 1800s, this, this did not exist. You could literally leave your town go two towns over, and everybody talked entirely differently. They had a different meter, different phraseology, different accent. They used different words for things. And um, I remember when I was a kid traveling with my parents, we would, we would often take road trips in the summer to go back down south because my, my dad was a southerner. And we would leave Philadelphia and drive into you know Virginia and North Carolina and places like that. And I'm a, I'm, I'm, I'm a Philly kid. So we stop at a restaurant and I order a steak sandwich. And what comes out? A piece of steak between two pieces of Wonder Bread. That's a steak sandwich. <laughs> it's like, this isn't a, this isn't a cheesesteak. Now, cheesesteak they never heard of. Suggesting to put cheesesteak on their version of a steak sandwich was a sacrilege. Now, this was, you can expand this to language. There was no McDonald's version of the English language. There was no Amer shared American idiom. Now, why do I describe all this in such detail? Because that lead, when you're trying to imagine how people would have talked in the early 1800s, it's up to your imagination. As long as you don't uh, put in anachronisms, have them speak using words that would have made no sense to people back then, you keep the language to what they would have known. 
It also helps to have older books, uh, read older books, because lots of words, you know, the word Wittershins. Nobody says Wittershins anymore. And it's such an awesome word. Wittershins, Wittershins means to run around without purpose. Basically run around in circles. Like when you're confused and you don't know what to do, you don't know which door to leave by. You, you, are, you, are, being, you are running Wittershins. But English language was loaded with words like that. And, um, you know, it helps to get books like, I have a book called Forgotten English. Uh, it helps to get a really, really deep thesaurus. The internet won't help you here. Um, the other thing is don't be afraid to make words up, to make phraseology up, because we don't know how they talk to you. Nobody's going to say, hey, you're wrong. They didn't use a word like that. As long as it's not anachronistic, you know, as long as they're not suddenly talking about television. You know, or uh, <laughs> or MILFs or something that makes no sense in the early 1800s. Um, you can get away with murder on this stuff. Um, now, in, in Hunter Ninja Bear, I, I was aided by the fact that um, the, you know, the folks at Phenom, uh, Tom Fanoglio and his brother, gave me this outline for Hunter Ninja Bear. And there was some dialogue sprinkled in it, which I adapted. And for some of the characters, I, you know, in, in addition to having them all speak in a way that I, I thought sounded period, uh, or at least sounded somewhat authentic, I also gave them all each their own separate voices. And there's one character in there whose name I can't recall at the moment. I think his name is Ghost Town. They, they came up with all these great names. His name is Ghost Town, and he's batshit crazy. And nothing he says makes a whole lot of sense. It only makes sense to him. And he's speaking English, but he needs an interpreter all the time. And a lot of what he says is non sequitur. A lot of he's, he, what he says is he's talking in parables or allegory or pictures in his head. And I imagine that's the way a lot of people would talk back then. Um, if you ever meet rural people, truly rural people who've grown up in a rural area and, and never really left their places you you know what i'm talking about um i <laughs> i i lived in pennsylvania I, I didn't leave that rural i lived outside of kennett square i had i had 10 acres and i hired a, a landscape guy basically to mow the lawn and he was a local guy came from a local family they've been there forever i mean just to give you an idea our, our road was named after a family that owned a dairy farm on our road and they had been there since 1870. Their family had been milking cows since 1870. So when you talk to these people, you kind of got to give them some leeway that they don't talk the way you talk. You know, uh, we're, we're only an hour outside of Philadelphia, but their, their patois, their manner of speaking, their phrasing, completely different. You have to kind of get used to it. And you have to get used to the fact that they never... In, in, at least in this area, their habit was to never answer a direct question with a direct answer. <laughs> yeah. And you had to get used to long pauses. These were people, who, they were farmers, right? They weren't in a hurry for anything. <laughs> so you had to give them their time. I thought, and I thought, this is awesome. This is, this is good for a city boy like me to learn from these people, to slow the hell down. <laughs> it doesn't all have to be rush, rush, rush running for the bus. You know, everything's going to take care of itself. Anyway, that's it. It's, there's a lot of freedom there when you're doing dialogue of people in the past because you, know, you can make a lot of it up. And, uh, and you can inform yourself by reading stuff in period. And there were plenty of memoirs and diaries and all that kind of stuff written so you can get a, a sense of the language. But for the most part, like most of what I do all day, I'm just making this stuff up. All right. Psionic Q. When the second Black Panther movie was announced, it was the first time I'd ever heard of Namor. I wasn't interested in watching the movie, but I looked up Namor out of curiosity. The first thing that popped in my mind was, oh, this is Marvel's ripoff of Aquaman. But I was surprised when I found out that it was actually the reverse. It's funny because everyone and their mother knows who Aquaman is, even before the movies. Meanwhile, casual comic book readers probably think Namor is a ripoff. So I wanted to ask, does originality matter? Does it only matter when a character is more popular? Does it peeve you that Aquaman is more popular than Namor, despite the latter being the original 
Um, yeah, I guess on a fanboy level, level, I don't like the fact that Aquaman is held in higher esteem, or at least is more of a household name than Namor, the Submariner. Um, and and and, Laura, and the biggest part of this is because you know, growing up, you know, we had Aquaman, and then uh, with the Marvel Age coming, to the Marvel Age, they brought Submariner back, and I was like, oh my god, who's this guy? This guy's so awesome. He's He's such an a-hole. <laughs> he doesn't. He doesn't give a crap what anybody thinks. This. This is. This is like this. This uh, half human, half fish, testosterone-driven being is like the coolest thing in comics. Um, and who the hell's Aquaman anymore? Because Aquaman to me was always a lame character. When I was a kid, I was never interested in Aquaman. He just seemed kind of ridiculous. Um, and to, to this day, I still think he's ridiculous. <laughs> but. He has the advantage of having been in a movie that, you know, made a whole lot of money, played by a popular actor. Uh, also, Aquaman was on Super Friends for years. Um, and uh, he just has that, you know, the imprimatur, if it were. If, if, but, but he does, Submariner does, you know, predate Aquaman by quite a bit of time, created by Bill Everett in World War II. Um, and... You know, but the, the Namor's problem is that he vanished for a while when Marvel stopped doing superhero comics and their attempt to return to them in the early 50s failed. Uh, Namor gets thrown on the dustbin of comic book history and then Aquaman comes out of nowhere and takes his place as the reigning superhero sea lord. And it's not until Submariner returns in Fantastic Four years later that uh, guys like me got to expose this character and how freaking awesome he was. Um, and this Black Panther movie is not going to do anything to help because apparently it's like a watered down, diluted, and you know, <laughs> although uh, Submariner would enjoy being watered down, uh, it, it's just, it's not Namor. It's not Namor. Uh, whatever it is, whatever they decide to do, whatever, you know, DEI choice they made in casting and, and, um, his accoutrements and whatever. It's it's a mess. It's a total mess. But yeah. Uh, so Mariner C, Aquaman, no, in my opinion. And, you know, popularity, what are you going to do? Popularity wins the day. Uh, there's lots of things that people don't know about that there's a more popular version of. And it's like, you know, it's like when you're a fan of, of a music group and then, and then they become big and you're like, well, the earlier stuff was better. You know, you don't like the stuff that everybody else likes. <laughs> it's just a fanboy knee-jerk reaction. But, you know, Namor, boom, he's the best. All right, now, somewhere. Yeah, that's what I wanted to say. Um, yeah, you have characters that are derivative, and comics is full of characters that are derivative. Uh, and often it's by the same creators. I mean, Fantastic Four is... Kirby's Challenges of the Unknown, thus recast as superheroes, things like that. And there's always arguments over who created what first. And, um, you know, Marvel and or DC and Fawcett beat each other up for years over Captain Marvel versus Superman. Who came first, chicken or the egg? Was Captain Marvel a ripoff of Superman? And they, you know, they spent so much time in court over this that eventually, um, you know, Fawcett threw in the towel. They just stopped printing comics and said, okay, forget this. This, is, this isn't even worthwhile. Um, and and the, the problem for Superman was to say that Captain Marvel was an imitator was that Captain Marvel was very, very, very successful at the newsstands. You know, he rivaled and sometimes exceeded Superman's sales. And so this was a big problem for DC because uh, they were looking at Captain Marvel ultimately supplanting Superman in the same way that Aquaman supplanted uh, Submariner in the minds of the uh, comic book reading audience. Okay, I think you get a twin spin here. I've kind of messed up all this stuff. Yeah, Cyanic Q, back again. Uh, I've been playing some Resident Evil 2 lately, and let's see where I am. And I wanted to know if you would be 
ever be interested in writing a comic based on the games. I personally prefer Resident Evil than The Walking Dead. As much as I like Walking Dead, it's more of an apocalyptic melodrama than it is a zombie horror survival story. The zombies could be replaced with anything else and it wouldn't make that much of a difference. Meanwhile, Resident Evil focuses way more on zombies and other horrific bioweapons, uh, which I'm more into. Um, yeah, I mean, Resident Evil versus Walking Dead, I mean, what Walking Dead became is, you know, just a you know, misery porn and, and a crybaby fest. Uh, where, you know, I, I know what you're saying. You, you want, I, I want to see zombies getting killed. I want to see, you know, horror suspense situations. I want to see the apocalypse writ large. Um, and would I, would, yeah, I mean, it's in my wheelhouse. Um, now I gotta say, I'm a, I'm a big fan of the Resident Evil movies and I could already hear you Resident Evil game fans going, boo, hiss, you're an idiot. You're a Philistine. How could you like those movies? Well, I'm not a gamer. I don't know much about the games. i certainly be willing to learn. I don't know much about the games, but I did like the movies a whole lot. I saw all of them. I've watched a couple of them a number of times. They're, they're solid popcorn, you know, goofy gonzo action films. And I like it. And, uh, you know, it's kind of, like I said, in my wheelhouse, but to write the game. Yeah. And, and this genre wouldn't be new to me. I've, I've written a zombie novel called Gomers available on Amazon, available on Kindle and in paperback. Uh, and so, you know, I, I've always liked this genre. I was a big fan of, you know, all the way back to George Romero. And, and before that, I Am Legend by Richard Matheson, which is essentially where the zombie action apocalypse thing begins, even though um, Matheson was writing about vampires. But um, yeah, I could do it. I would, I, I would sign up for that. That would be a lot of fun if the money was right. And the artist was good. Ian Potash, hi Chuck, I'm interested in here to hear you mention Henry Silva in relation to the inspiration for Bane, his co-star Richard Boone in It's All T. How did you feel hearing a classic actor like Silva being one of your, to bring one of your characters to life for the animated series? One small quirk is they had him tone down his accent when the show was revised for the new Batman adventures. Any preference there? Um, yeah, I mean, when I heard Henry Silva was going to do the voice, I was like, okay, all right, they're going to get the character right. You know, Henry Silva he could do the accent. He'll, he'll sound menacing as hell. This guy had a freaky scary voice uh, in, a, in, a, in addition to, you know, the sinister natural appearance. I mean, he was like two chromosomes away from being, you know, matinee idol handsome. But there was just something in his features that made you think, oh, my God, I don't, I don't, I don't want to meet this guy in an alley. You know, he wasn't ugly. He just looked evil, just looked dangerous. And, of course, he's perfect for, uh, to play Bane, to do the voice of Bane, in addition to being a, being a terrific actor. Uh, you know, I mean, nobody sold bad guy like Henry Silva could sell bad guy. Um, you know, he, he had all the chops. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, I was over the moon, you know, super pleased. Um, I mean, they made some great voice choices on that show. Uh, and 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 he was one of them. They, I mean, they got some top flight Hollywood talent to do those voices. Uh, pretty amazing. Uh, losing the accent, yeah, I'm not happy about it. I want Bane to be a Hispanic guy. I mean, Danny Trejo voiced him on, on one of the series. I can't remember which one. And I thought that was cool too. Danny Trejo, uh, perfect voice for Bane. So, Cameron Morgan, what are some of your favorite Chinese and/or Japanese-based comics, books, or films? What are some of the big influences you had for Way of the Rat? Well, I'm going to concentrate on the, on the Way of the Rat influences uh, for this question because I, I, there's so many uh, Asian films I like. I could just go on and on and on. Uh, I could do a separate podcast just about that stuff. Um, but, yeah, Way of the Rat was a comic book series. I did 24 issues for CrossGen back in the day. Uh, majority of them, I believe, by me and Jeff Johnson. Uh, I've said it before, I'll say it again, I could not have done this series without Jeff. Jeff uh, is a martial artist, has a lot of, his, uh, has a keen interest in Asian history, and he really brought it to this. I mean, he brought an authenticity, a believability, uh, in addition to doing some amazing fight sequences in this book. Uh, if you ever get a chance, uh, hopefully Marvel will collect it in an omnibus. I think it's certainly worthwhile, because um, it was... Uh, beautifully drawn throughout 
uh, even when Jeff left, you know, we, we had some tremendously talented people working on it to follow him. Um, now, some of the influences of Hong Kong action films, Hong Kong martial arts films were exploding in the uh, mid 80s into the 90s here in the United States. Really hard to get. I used to haunt laser disc stores in, in Chinatown, New York, until they would throw me out. I've said this before, but it's worth sharing again. I got thrown out of one store in Chinatown. I'm going through laser discs, and I asked how much they cost, and the guy said, "These are not for you." I just pointed to the door. Uh, <laughs> I was out of there. But you could buy bootlegs, and uh, eventually, laser discs became available. Mail order. Remember mail order? They send you a catalog in the mail. No internet. Uh, and Bride with White Hair, big influence. Uh, period fantasy film. Uh, uh, and it's it's um, it's got like fairy tale elements to it, but it's also a balls out, you know, martial arts flick as well. And just beautifully photographed, you know, wonderfully acted, wonderfully realized. It was like my this was my intro into Asian mythology. And Way of the Rat, you know, has, you know, a great degree of fantasy elements in it. So this was a big influence. Also, Burning Paradise. Uh, I've, I've mentioned this film before. It's Ringo Lam, who's a prolific Hong Kong film director. This was his only martial arts film. And it is a corker. It is grim and nasty. It's like a combination of a kung fu movie and a, and a horror film. Uh, as, uh, you know, legendary Chinese martial arts heroes are taken prisoner and forced into slavery in, in the, the dungeons of uh, this temple, of the Red Lotus Temple. And uh, the martial arts stuff is terrific. There's no wire work. It's all for real. Uh, the sets are amazing. The villains are loathsome and disgusting, and you can't wait to see them die. Uh, and just some terrific action stuff. And it's, it's a film I don't hear talked about a lot. And it's a shame Lam didn't do more of these period martial arts films, but I I think this was his statement. This is like, this is my ultimate period martial arts film. Big influence uh, for me on Way of the Rat. And I, and I have to add, Jeff Johnson was as big a fan of all this stuff as I was. Uh, we were watching tons of uh, Korean, Japanese, Chinese, Hong Kong action films while we were doing Way of the Rat. We kept suggesting them back and forth to each other. I remember we fell in love with the My, My Wife is a Gangster series. Um once Upon a Time in China movies with uh, Jet Li, uh, these were a big influence for, you know, the, the big uh, cast of hundreds uh, martial arts sequences, the kind of stuff we were doing in Way of the Rat. And again, you know, it's a period martial arts actioner. Um, and this is, a, this is a terrific series. Uh, but largely it was Jackie Chan uh, and mostly Dr Drunken Master 2. Uh, Jackie Chan's, um, like, last big period martial arts film. Um, Chan was a big influence on the series in the characterization of Boone, because Boone is a thief, and he's sort of a serial comic guy. He's, he's like a Jackie Chan character in that he's, he's, um, he's not always the coolest guy in the world. He's not Jet Li. He's not Donnie Yen. He's uh, Buster Keaton. And uh, Boone would get himself into all these kind of troubles, and I thought that kind of character was better than the... Uh, you know, the steely-eyed martial arts tough guy. That, that it would be different. We made him a thief instead of, you know, a straight-up martial artist. And we gave him a monkey, talking monkey companion, which just seemed to uh, fit the tone we were going for of a uh, period martial arts fantasy with uh, a good degree of humor in it. Cameron Morgan again. Did you have an opportunity to pitch for a samurai story with CrossGen? How did Ron Mars get onto writing The Path? The Path was a samurai series. I forget how many issues that ran uh, by uh, Ron Mars and Bart Sears uh, with wonderful inks by Mark uh, Pennington. And uh, I didn't know. They, I mean, I found out along with everybody else that Ron was going to be doing this. And I didn't pitch one because I had just gotten to CrossGen and I already had a full plate. They had given me, uh, I, I was at, at this time, I was putting together Way of the Rat, and I was um, also assigned Crux and Sigil. So I had three monthlies, and that was kind of all that CrossGen demanded of me was three monthlies. 
I ended up writing a lot more. I wrote specials and miniseries and fill-in issues for other writers. And I think at the end, I was writing four books every month or more. I, I can't even remember. I, yeah, I, I was probably doing five because uh, <laughs> I had uh, I had Sigil, I had Crux, I had Brath, I had Way of the Rat, and then I had uh, El Cazador, um, which really was the book I was concentrating on most. That's This is the book I most wanted to do for CrossGen was a pirate book. I, I, I never had a samurai book in mind. I've written samurai stuff in the past, but I didn't have a samurai book in mind for CrossGen. I really thought a pirate book was the next best fit for, um, for the company. So uh, that's what I did in secret. <laughs> I've told that story before where I created El Cazador without really informing anybody except Steve Epting, the artist, that this is what we were going to be doing uh, following his run on Crux. Uh, I, 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 uh, I took a, a hint from Jeff Johnson who said that one thing he learned in the Army was it was always better to apologize than ask permission. <laughs> so I took that to the nth degree and created this uh, pirate series of Cross Gen. And uh, you know the rest of the story if you've, you've heard these videos. Uh, okay, Mattel Jones. Are you familiar with Black Max? It appeared in the British comic book weekly Thunder back in 1970-71. It looks like the writer Frank Pepper must have been a pulp fan, G8 in particular. This has been reprinted recently in its entirety by Rebellion Books under their Treasury of British Comics line. I had never heard of this series until you told me, and thank goodness she told me. I only wish she told me a little sooner because it's reprinted in three volumes and the first volume is really expensive. The cheapest I've found it for is a hundred bucks. So uh, I bought volume two. <laughs> I found volume two on eBay for under 20. And I'm going to read it and if I like it, and I think I really will like it, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to order the other two volumes. But um, it, it sounded really interesting in, in your email. And then it got real interesting when I looked it up, and it's drawn by Alfonso Font. Alfonso Font is one of my favorite uh, comic book artists of all time. And uh, he's an Argentine. And the Argentines in this period, up until the Falklands War, um, a lot of the British weeklies were drawn by artists from Argentina. And then they all lost their jobs when the Falklands War began. Uh, or as the Argentines referred to it, the Malvinas Islands. Um, but yeah, I mean, the G8 influence is pretty darn obvious. Here you got a giant bat attacking a uh, tri-wing uh, Fokker plane. And uh, yeah, G8 had the Botstaffel uh, that continuously played G8 and his battle aces back in the old pulp days. So uh, uh, this Frank Pepper guy was certainly familiar with G8. And yeah, I'm looking forward to the volume coming and reading it. Probably review it on what you're reading. But it really, uh, shout out, thank you for recommending this. I had no idea that these have been reprinted. Nick Lenz, I've been reviewing your work on Detective Comics, Batman, Nightwing, Robin, Green Arrow, Punisher, Mark Spector, Moon Knight, Van Helsing, and Robin Hood for my YouTube channel. I'll have to check that out. I have a question about the specials that Punisher had for his first ongoing series, Back to School, Holiday, and Summer. Who came up with these? I know you wrote stories for two of these specials. Um, yeah. Uh, hold on. I, yeah. It, that was Don Daly. <laughs> Don Daly came up with these ideas for the Punisher Christmas special. Uh, the Punisher holiday special, you know, things like that. And um, <laughs> a lot of people thought they were in poor taste, which just encouraged Don to do more of them. <laughs> and, you know, obviously post Columbine, the Punisher back to school, school special would be an extremely poor taste. But, you know, he would come up with these things, and it was largely to give tryouts to new artists and in some cases, new writers. Uh, Don produced an astounding amount or assigned an astounding amount of Punisher material. Um, there are rumors that when Don was fired, 
there was a half a million dollars in Punisher inventory in his flat files that had not been yet published. And I think that's exaggerated, but um, there was a lot. And I know there was a lot because there was a lot of stuff I did, you know, entire graphic novels. I recently found out there's a, there's a whole graphic novel by Mike Barron that was never published. Uh, there was miniseries and specials and one shots. I know a number of Punisher short, short stories I did that were drawn and never published. Why Marvel wouldn't go back uh, and, you know, make, just print them in black and white. Just put out a big old paperback of unpublished pub Punisher stories. Uh, why wouldn't you do that? They, don't, they didn't even sell the stuff overseas, which seemed to be um, low-hanging fruit to me. But, um, yeah, Don, Don is the, the genius behind the, the Punisher uh, specials. And Marvel didn't discourage him because they created new number ones. And we all know retailers love new number ones. So at least the first one would sell really big. Uh, this Punisher holiday special, I remember, that I've told this story before, but you know, or you don't. You, all of you don't watch all the videos. But this Punisher holiday special, um, I have fond memories of, because uh, I was I was visiting Flint Henry at his studio, and Don tracked me down there. He called at home, and my wife said, "Well, he's visiting Flint." And Don's like, "Well, give me that number." And Don calls Flint, and Flint puts me on the phone, and Don says, "I got an artist here. His wife just had a baby, and he needs work. I want you to write a story." Uh, set in the winter time, and I'm like, okay, uh, well, uh, I, I can, you know, tomorrow I'll take a look and how many pages. And Don says, no, no, he needs work right now. His wife just had a baby. I want to give him work right now. Write me a story right now. I'm like, like over the phone. <laughs> he says, yeah. And I said, look, call me back in 15 minutes, and I'll give you the first three pages, and then I'll write the rest when I get home. I'll write it before the week's over but this will get him started. And uh, so I sat down with a legal pad at, at Flint's kitchen table and wrote the first three pages of this holiday special sniper story. <laughs> and Don called back in 15 minutes on the dot and I read him the pages. And uh, then he assigned it to the artist who took it home and drew a fantastic story. And it was Dale Eaglesham. I, and if I'm not mistaken, it might've been Dale's first work for Marvel. Uh, so there you go. Crazy. But that's that's the way Don worked, man. He was loosey-goosey. You never knew what was going to happen. You never knew when the phone rang and it was Don Daly what the hell he was going to tell you. He might want to tell you about a great restaurant he just went to or a terrific movie he just saw or assign you something. And, you know, I love The Punisher, so I said yes every time. Okay, one more thing. I didn't do the movie suggestions last week, and I heard from a lot of you, hey, where are my movie suggestions? So uh, let's finish up 1979. We're, we're going to finish out the 70s today. Um, it's a movie called Chilly Scenes of Winter, uh, directed by Joan Micklin Silver. It was based on a novel by Ann Beatty, who was a frequent writer for the National Lampoon. And Chilly Scenes of Winter... Uh, sounds like an Ingmar Bergman film, and it could have been an Ingmar Bergman film, except it's it's pretty funny too. Um, it's it's the anti-romantic comedy. This takes the rom-com and stands it on its head. John John Hurd is a he works in an office and he's infatuated with Mary Beth Hurt, and he can't get her out of his mind, and he just wants the two of them to be together, but. She's with another guy. I don't know if she's living with him or married. I haven't watched the movie recently. But she's in a relationship, and she has no really interest in breaking it up. But Hurd is just so freaking insistent. He's, he's self-centered and abrasive and spacey and, and a bit of an overgrown child. And that's the key to this whole movie is that you know, I've often said, and people have asked about, you know, romance and stories and everything else, that for a romance in a movie or any kind of story to work, we have to fall in love with the two people first and then want them to be together because we love them so much. We want both of them to be happy. And the only way they can possibly be happy is to be together. And we want that for them. And this is an anti-romantic comedy because we kind of fall in love with Mary, Mary Beth Hurt, but we really don't fall in love with John Hurt. He's... We're like through the whole movie thinking, you know, keep away from her. 
you know, if you could have like pulled her aside and said, look, you gotta, you gotta get a restraining order. You gotta get a, this guy out of your life, right? You gotta send some of your brothers over to beat the crap out of him, and keep him away from you. And so that's what makes it the anti-romantic comedy. These two do not belong together. And I think that's the whole point of the story. The whole, you know, it's certainly closer to real life than the typical Tom Hanks, Meg Ryan movie. And um, it's, it's one of the reasons I like it. And it's got some really funny moments. And Hurd is terrific. As a guy we can all relate to. You know, the guy shooting for a girl is way out of his league. And, uh, and, and he really should know better than to inflict himself on her. Next one is Cuba. This is a Richard Lester directed film and it takes place in Cuba before, well, at the cusp of the Fidel Castro revolution to turn the island communist. And it's uh, Sean Connery is a British mercenary hired to train Batista's army. Uh, Batista was the dictator who ran Cuba prior to Fidel. And he was such a cruel guy, and he was so mean, and he was so nasty, and the Cubans today would have him back in a heartbeat. Because <laughs> he was nowhere near as bad as the Castro brothers would turn out to be. In any case, I editorialize. Uh, it's kind of a Casablanca story in that he runs into Brooke Adams, an old flame of his, and she's married to, an, kind of like uh, Chili Scenes of Winter, she's married to an abusive plantation owner. And Connery's like, you know, you got to get out of here because this place is going to hell. And I can get you out of here and we can be together and all the rest of it. And this is one where you very much want the two of them to be together. You very much like them and you realize they can only be happy with each other. And possibly even, you know, Brooke Adams' life is in danger if she keeps hanging around Havana too much. Um, it's Richard Lester. It's a typical Richard Lester film. He makes a lot of effort to bring you right into the this world, right into this period, right into the events. And like most Richard Lester movies, there's a number of uh, comic asides and little bits of business going on in the background. Uh, there's, there's a, when it comes to portraying the Batista regime, uh, which is embodied by Martin Balsam in this film, uh, playing a Cuban general, it, it, uh, he uses a lot of uh, satiric elements to bring out uh, how oppressive uh, the Batista regime was and how dangerous Cuba was in this period. Uh, but it's a cool film and it's, it's mostly forgotten today. It's probably on a streaming service somewhere. Next one, we're going to move to 1980 with Tom Horn. This is the last of the two movies that Steve McQueen made before he uh, died way too soon. Um, this is an awesome Western, one of my favorite Westerns. And it tells the true story of the final years of Tom Horn. Tom Horn was a um, army scout, buffalo hunter, every, you know, jack of all trades in the Old West. Uh, he most famously rode into Geronimo's camp and talked him into surrendering. Uh, that took a pair of cojones the size of Arizona. <laughs> but, but Horn did it, and he had this he was also a rough rider. He was there with Teddy Roosevelt when they stormed San Juan Hill. So this guy saw it all, did it all. And in his last days, he was a regulator for the uh, a cattle association. And what a regulator did was he went around and he killed rustlers. Now, this was not an official position. And in this movie especially, they portray how the Cattlemen's Association had total deniability about, you know, oh, we didn't hire him. There's no paper sign. There's no nothing. It's like, these are the people we need dead. You're going to go out and kill them. And Horn is accused of murdering a young boy. And we're never, it's never made clear in the movie whether he, he did it or not. We have a sense that he was framed because he was becoming an embarrassment to the Cattlemen's Association because he was leaving so many dead rustlers out there on the prairie that they just kind of like, yeah, okay, we're done with this guy. I mean, this is an old, old story where, you know, you, especially in Westerns, where we hired you to do a job, but you're doing it too damn good. And uh, we got no way out of this except to hang you. And Horn was put on trial, uh, and he famously 
did not defend himself. He he had no lawyer, and his only defense was, "Hey, I'm Tom Horn. Damn it! Uh, if you don't just take me at my word, I didn't do it. Well, I got nothing else to say." And famously, Tom Horn was so beloved in the West that he no man would hang him, and so they had to bring in a hangman who used a device that would it was a time device that would hang you, so no one was actually pulling the lever. Um, it, it was a, it was, it dealt with, uh, water and gravity. It was a really complex Rube Goldberg type device. <clears throat> McQueen is terrific in the role. Uh, it's a, it's super authentic Western. Uh, Linda Evans is in the cast, Richard Farnsworth, and, uh, just a really, really good, if dour and somewhat bleak Western. And, uh, I really dug it. It was, um, I believe written, but I know directed by Tom Grease, who uh, most famous for doing the Rat Patrol, creating the Rat Patrol TV series. But um, it, it's a good one. My only regret, and I, and it, you know, I probably wouldn't have done this either if I was making the movie, because you don't know how it's going to come off. Um, when Tom Horn was standing on the gallows waiting for the trap to, you know, drop beneath him. Uh, he sang the uh, choir hymn, Life is Like a Mountain Railroad, to a, you know, uh, quiet audience of hundreds who had shown up to see him hang uh, and basically celebrate his life before um, he was lynched. <laughs> so, uh, but I can see where the filmmakers are probably, eh, we don't know how that's going to play with modern audiences. Modern audiences. But, uh, yeah, excellent, excellent movie. If you ever get a chance to see it, it's probably streaming somewhere. Uh, okay, Bruno Bookstore. Bruno Bookstore at gmail.com. Bruno Bookstore at gmail.com if you want to contact me, if you have questions you would want to ask, and um, all the rest. So, um, but, you know, I was going to say before I go, but I'll save that for next time. Hey, how's that for a teaser? Terrible teaser. Uh, anyway, thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Thanks for liking, subscribing. Notice I didn't bother you about subscribing this time because I really don't even care anymore. Uh, and I will see all of you down the road.